Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 99. 99 already. 99! Ooh. So I get 100. That's quite exciting. You get 100. Yeah. Have you prepared? Nothing the slightest. No. <laughs> we need, we're expecting something big, big things from you, Nick. Where are you? You may be disappointed. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just putting it out there now, and then I'm going to blow you all away. Pull it out of the box in a big top hat. Yes. Pull it out of a top hat in a box, and then it's got another top hat in it. Pull a top hat out of a rabbit. <laughs> you got upsetting. <laughs> but for now, it's episode 99. For now, it is episode 99. 99, red balloons, party like it's 1999. Yep, all those things. 99 uh, with uh, ice cream. Yeah, 99 ice creams. Yes, it's the, it's the Mr. Whippy with the flick. Delicious. Yes, the juice cost 99p 400 years ago. <laughs> oh, how are you, Nick? I'm all right. Yeah, all right. No, I want an ice cream, which is not helpful. <laughs> you, you're getting a run of these things. I keep mentioning confectionery to you, and then you just go, oh, now I want them, and then you just text me pictures. I want all confectionery all the time. <laughs> I mentioned a Toblerone. You did, and, then... and that was on my mind for about two weeks. <laughs> constantly just dreaming of Toblerones going oh my god I want a Toblerone I haven't thought about one for years and then you mention it <laughs> and then eventually I, I succumbed to Toblerone frenzy and then you sent me a picture of it <laughs> of the massive Toblerone I ate in one day <laughs> that you were like yes I've got a Toblerone and then I texted you that morning going I just got a McDonald's breakfast oh god I want a McDonald's breakfast now yeah no I'm, I'm good with that one I'll no. buy another, another Toblerone I'll be fine get the two triangles and sandwich a McMuffin in there. between them no 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 none of that none of that <laughs> they could be contained within no, that sounds very unpleasant oh well aside from Toblerones any poisonings this week no I've only eaten Toblerone that's good. So that's all I've had, so... That's a good logic, actually. Only eat one thing. I know it's fine. You know it's fine. I know it's good. The Swiss will be on to you soon. <laughs> then I'll move on to something else. Then I'll actually eat nothing but Twixes. Oh, that's a really good diet. Yeah, absolutely. I want a Twix now. <gasps> it's catching! <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the Swiss secretly wanting to kill us, and confectionery morning, noon and night for all your meals, I think it's time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers! Yeah, these get weirder and weirder, actually. <laughs> The Patreons get weirder and weirder every week. We have to up our game. Thank you very much. To Chelsea Friel. To Angela May. And to Jamie Curry. And to Amanda Sim. Thank you very much. Thank you, you delicious, lovely Patreon subscribers. You're all very, very sexy. You're all very delightful. Had a good time on Patreon this week, didn't we? Went back to Australia. Oh, that was. We indeed. told the tale of two different kinds of bush ranger. Double murdery shenanigans. And we've been asking everyone on Patreon, and we ask you too, where are you in life <laughs> physically mentally yes, personal um, growth where are you emotionally no where are you in the world we we haven't asked this in a little while where are all our delicious listeners from where are you listening to this right now tell us in the comments of any of the social media apps that you follow or on the comments of this episode yeah just message it. tell us tell us where you are tag us in a post and say i'm listening to this on top of a mountain in swindon uh, that would be impressive, I feel. It would be good. Mountain of Toblerone. Yes, the, the mountainous region of Swindon. Well, Nick, are you ready? Yes. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> or we could drink poison, talk about cocktails. Mm. Mm, you're on the verge. I'm on the verge. It's been the poison is tempting. <laughs> <laughs> it's my story this week. This is true. I get to sit and go, ooh. There you go. Hooray, hooray, hooray. Yeah. Because we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in oh, hand. Oh, God, no. No. Every week, dear listeners, as you know, we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell. That will flavour our cocktail of the week. So my story, my pick. Mm. And this week's classic ingredient classic, is... Classic, classic flavouring. It is a bicycle. Classic, classic ingredient. It is. Cocktail or otherwise, bicycle flavour. Well, I gave you options and you went, bicycle, bicycle is the one, bicycle should I'm be... I'm not entirely sure I did that. You gave me <laughs> one other option, which was there's just nothing. I did give you a third one, which was just a shotgun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that was for a different story, so that's okay. Indeed. It may still come back I to mean, that. I mean, considering as we had rum last week, I feel that probably a challenge was in order. There you go. Because that, that was a bit too on the nose, really, wasn't it, for an there ingredient? You, you can use a bicycle to power a kiln. Kiln. A kiln. Whoa! Wow! Why? Okay. Mm. Now, why were you having a kiln this week? Because that's what I thought it still was for two seconds there. Because <laughs> that's what you make booze in. You do. You make a it kiln. in a kiln. <laughs> if you don't have a still, you make it in a kiln and you improvise. But you can use a bicycle to power all the electrics of your cocktail making. Yes. 
in th- we think you probably boring. stop now. <laughs> I think it's important that I do. <laughs> I think it's very important that you do. Uh, so with bicycle as the inspiration, what have you yes. come up with? Well, there aren't that many bicycle flavoured cocktails, it has to be said. Really? Yeah, I was surprised. I was just as surprised as you are. I don't know where we're going this week for this story. I don't know where if we're staying England, UK based, or we're going further afield. Okay. I'm, I'm intrigued to find out. But this week we are having Le Bicyclette. You were so proud of that. So I'm hoping we go to France. I'd be very pleased if we go to France. Ah, perhaps Switzerland. But sorry, did should we say it again? Le bicyclette. Le bicyclette. Le bicyclette. You do like to say that, don't you? I love anything in a French, in a French accent, <laughs> especially when it's all le bicyclette. Le bicyclette. <laughs> it's nicely clipped, isn't it? <laughs> is that actually? That's not the word for bicycle, though. In well, French. Well, it's it is now. It's vélo in French. It's that is the name of this cocktail. <laughs> Bicycle That's French. what you do when you're English. You just say English words in a French accent, and then you are speaking French. That's how this works. But then no one would go, oh, I want le velou in the cocktail bar. You know, I want le bicyclette. Who is judging these things by their name? Many, many. I judge lots of cocktails by their name. But you're saying you're, you wouldn't drink a velo? Yeah, I know. I prefer le bicyclette. Le bicyclette. Yeah, I'm going with that. Much better. Okay, I love this already. <laughs> well, we shall take our discussions of the French language <laughs> off air, but I think it is high time for us to get a cocktail, so let's go into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up storm, so we'll see you in a minute. I'll see you in a bit. And we're back! Hello! Oh, Nick. Le bicyclette. Le bicyclette. Le bicyclette. It is very golden. Is it golden? Is it hue? It, it's very clear. It's very clear. Yes, we don't often have a clear drink. So it's, a, it's a sort of a light browny, goldy colour. Oh no, I think it's a goldy you're going, amber. You're golding maybe? with goldy. Okay, fair enough. So yeah. sophisticated. Yes. Yeah, so, well, hopefully so. We shall okay. find out. All right. So we'll let's let's. I, I don't Give know. it a go. I don't know. I'm scared. Okay. What does it smell? It smells of booze. It smells of booze. Well, well done. done. Well, well it smells yes. of bicycles. Excellent. Okay. Right. That's we're diving. Nice oily twang going on there. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Okay. Let's taste. <laughs> <laughs> Yum, 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 yum. Okay. Oh, I'm into that. Yeah. Nice. It's not world beating. But it's, it's, not, it's not. No, indeed. But it's very, very pleasant. But it's strong. It, there, there is that as well. It is, yes, there, that is definitely strong. I think that needs to be a category of like, oh, it's not world beating, but it's strong. <laughs> so we'd like it. <laughs> a stirred cocktail, I sense. Yes, indeed. From the noises I heard you. From the stirring that was going on. The rotating in the kitchen. From all the rotating. <laughs> this is... um. Mm, that's, that's perfectly pleasant. A good sipping one, yeah. but strong. It's not really bold on flavour. No, it doesn't punch you around the face. In a good way. Mm. No, I like it though. But it doesn't help. I've just I've been drinking Negroni. Just bring it on. But no, mm. I like no, I like that. It's a strong one. You can definitely taste yeah. the alcohol, but it's nicely balanced. There's definitely alcohol in that. Tell, tell us what's going on. What's Wait, going on? We have the essence of bicycle. <laughs> Distilled bicycles. <laughs> With just sweat and balls. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, essence of balls. That's essence what's on of there. balls. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> essence of bicycle. Delicious. Essence of bicycle. So we have some gin. Oh, okay. Classic bicycling <laughs> beverage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you not? Do you not have gin when you bicycle? I have gin everywhere. See, exactly. So it's fine. We have some red vermouth. Oh, okay. Which is where the uh, where your goldeny hue is coming from. I feel well, it's very pale. Actually, it's not well, red at there's, all. There's not much of it. There's more gin than there is vermouth. So <laughs> okay, it is diluted the red colour. Okay, bit of elderflower. Oh, elderflower. Oh, I'm not getting the elderflower no. today. Is there a bit in there. Uh huh. And a bit of peach. Some peach. Peach, peach bitters. Peach bitters. Oh, you've yeah. been on the bloody bitters buying, haven't you? <laughs> I, I got very exciting. I bought a little set, <laughs> and they're little, only little bottles. I thought I don't need much. They're little bottles, and it's a nice set. And I've got olive. Ooh. Olive bitters, chocolate bitters, peach bitters, <gasps> cucumber bitters. Whoa. Some other bitters. <laughs> and some other bitters. I think there were six in the box. That's amazing. Oh, good. So, yeah. Bitters so, galore. Uh, yeah, so rather than buying a big bottle, big bottle I'm never going to get through a big bottle of peach bitters. So I bought a little, little bottle. And little many bottle. other little bottles for the same price. That's a great idea. It's a bargain. I must also point out that during all of this, Nick made hand gestures to show me what was a little bottle and little what bottle. was a case of six. Big bottle. <laughs> this is very good podcast material going on here, I'll have you know. <laughs> Big fish, little fish, cardboard box. <laughs> Big bitters, more bitters. <laughs> Case of bitters. <laughs> bitters. <laughs> bitter, bitter, bitter. Okay, now we have to do a dance track. <laughs> so, knowing everything that's in there, yeah, I wasn't expecting any of that. <laughs> I don't what know. What were you expecting? I, I'm not going to lie. 
because it would be wrong. It would be very wrong. I looked in the kitchen and <gasps> I don't really look at the ingredients you have. I saw none of that. I saw a bottle of bourbon on the side and I went, ah, it will have bourbon in it. That's, that's it. So yeah, I was... that's how I've learned now to leave out <laughs> false clues. Decoys, <laughs> Decoy, if you will. Decoy beverages. Uh, that was mainly because I had some bourbon before you arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so now I know everything that's in it. Tasting it again. The peach, I think I'm getting... That's the thing about bitters. It always sounds like you're going, how could you possibly be able to taste the flavour of bitters with a couple of dashes? But you can. But you can. There is uh, a nice... It's like seasoning for your drink. Yeah, it is. It's that little seasoning. I'm really not getting the elderflower in this mm. one at all. Well, I'll make another one without the, without the elderflower. And, oh, God. Is this going to be one of those things where you lecture me going, you'll miss it if it's not there? Absolutely. <laughs> we'll lecture you on all things I possibly can because it's fun. It's an interesting combination of gin and red vermouth. We don't normally have those together apart from in a Negroni. Negroni and others. You really set yourself up there. <laughs> I really you? did. Mm, oh. I was thinking, oh, there are loads. And I'm thinking, no, not that one. No, that one. Not that the one list was going to come out to read Sinead the Riot Act. Yeah, and what and happened? Then my brain went there. I don't think it's as world beating as some others. Because well, they can't all be world beating. No, they can't. But this is perfectly serviceable, and I sense you're going to get very merry with them. <laughs> I've got a Negroni and that on the go currently. <laughs> After already having two and, um, No, no, I'm only I having a. a uh, fact, mm. uh, moving on. You just said you just had some bourbon. I, yeah, well, I had a bourbon. <laughs> no, 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 no. Bourbon, bourbon, bourbon. Before <laughs> this bodes very well. We have our bicycle. I don't get the name with this at all it's bicycle i know but i'm saying like, what that's are, what, what it are, is what are the ingredients that make it called a bicycle i don't know i never questioned this before in nearly 100 episodes of like i don't think that that matches but still the man who invented this was riding a bicycle what he thought <laughs> thinking <of it. laughs> thinking oh he was thinking he was a bartender he was cycling to work and he thought oh i know i will put these this and this, and this together and i'll make a lovely drink Oh, that's a lovely story. And then he, and he realised, oh, I should call it La Bicyclette, because I was inspired by my bicycle ride through a bottle of gin. You see, that's a nice story. See, that's what happened. You think you can't improvise sometimes, and yet you tell us a tale that tugged at the heartstrings. beautiful, strings. beautiful stories. <laughs> With our bicyclettes firmly in hand. I promised you bicycles, Nick. You really did. And this better not be just like, oh, yes, he had a bicycle. We are going to go on a lovely bicycle ride today. Nice. And it's not just that someone once in this story saw a bicycle, rode it for a bit and then got off and then was murdered. <laughs> not much is known about his childhood, <laughs> but for his sixth birthday, he got a bicycle. I think that would be valid if we just knew one thing and it was bicycle. But no, 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 no. We're going to go for a lovely bicycle ride, chaps. We are in England. We're not going to France. I'm so um, sorry. It's not a French bicycle. It might have been made in France. Made in France. I, I very much think it wasn't. <laughs> No, we are going through the English countryside on a lovely bicycle ride. Oh. We are going to enjoy the sights and the sounds and enjoy a dose of murder. <laughs> a nice class of bims on the way. Indeed. <laughs> well, this is very this kind of territory. We've got to think we're in 1919 Ooh. in uh, Leicestershire. But now, yes, you were cycling through lovely country lanes and villages. Pims o'clock, everybody. Cream teas and, and bonnets and... Whatever else you wear and on the a bike. The of the First World War. <laughs> <laughs> it was delightful. It's absolutely wonderful. People are crying and screaming in the streets. Now, this is a case that anyone who's read the episode notes or seen the title of it will understand. But for you, Nick, who knows yes, nothing of what is to come. Nothing. It's a case that many people, <laughs> modern people say, I think this is a case worthy of Sherlock Holmes. Disney. <laughs> okay. But we'll come back to that. Mm. Okay. Yes, we're going on a bicycle ride, Nick, with the very lovely Bella Wright. Oh, oh, I know this. Do you though? Did she end up in a witch elm? No. Ah. I knew you were going to go there. It's, it's, it's not thought, who put Bella in the witch elm. It's not who put Bella in the witch elm. We okay. Should, well, we should do that one day, but There's it's so such little a on him. it's such a short story. Yeah. It's all just sort of folklorey gruesomeness. But yeah. Someday, oh, I thought that's where you were going with that. I thought you'd found some secret dossier of facts. There are more people called Bella in the world. Hmm. Now, this is Annie Bella Wright. Bella to her friends. So, Annie Bella Wright was born in 1897, the eldest of seven children <clears throat> to, and it is pointed out, an illiterate labourer and his wife. That's just mean. Don't point out that he can't read. <laughs> they grow up in uh, Stoughton in Leicestershire. 
I'm sure and it's delightful. I'm going to say Leicestershire and Leicester wrong many times because when I see them on the page, mm, when I see them on the page, it's like the Monzi. Can't <laughs> can't do it. Can't do it, Nick. Bella was of the working class, but she attends school. She gets a decent education, and until the age of twelve, before she goes into domestic service. Mm. Yes, yeah, she gets twelve years before she just has to go out Good and going. work. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So Bella is a domestic servant. She works in this profession for a while, but she would eventually leave her post to lend a hand to the war effort. Nice. Good for her. She's going to take up a job in a factory, a factory job, mm-hmm. because all the chaps are away. Indeed. In the 1910s and 1914 to 1918, we all know. She is going to take up a factory job while the men of Leicestershire are away fighting the First World War. Yep. Many people did. So she took a job as a rubber hand. Okay. Mm-hmm. Making rubber hands? There's a lot of rubber hands in the world and we oh. need people to make them. She was just doing her bit. What does a rubber hand do? She worked at the Bates & Co. rubber factory. Right. In Leicester. They made tyres. All sorts of rubber. Yes. Uh, a rubber hand is just someone who, I think, lends a hand to the rubber. She doesn't stand there with a hand. Going, I was saying, made it, made it probably makes more sense than making fake hands made of rubber. Um. <laughs> Maybe. As it, she probably is at, at, like on the conveyor belts and yes. like, you know, lending a hand to the rubber efforts of the war. Quite right. People need rubber. Lots of tyres needed. Absolutely. In July 1919, Bella was by now 22, had blossomed into a very pretty young lady, very well liked locally in the village that she lived in. She had a fiancé, Archie Ward. Isn't that oh, a good, classic sort of 1910s? 19, yeah, good 1900s name. Yeah, yeah. Archie Ward was stationed on HMS Diadem. He was a stoker. And she was a very happy young lady living in Little Stretton. Charming village. Delightful. Good character. And she often rode to and from her job on her trusty bicycle. Mm-hmm. That's not the only leg. Okay, Don't good, you good, worry. Good, good. It's not just she rode bicycles. She rode a bicycle once well To death. <laughs> On the 5th of July, 1919, Bella rose later in the day because she'd been working the evening shift at the rubber factory. People need rubber chickens, Nick. Quite right. When she rose, she wrote a letter to Archie. Oh, nice. Who was waiting to be demobbed in Portsmouth because 1919, the war is over. She bid her mother goodbye and she set off later in the afternoon on her trusty bicycle to deliver her letter to Archie to the postmistress and to run some errands. I don't know what the letter said. I... Let's assume it was a lovely, charming love letter. I'm sure it was. I love you. I hope you come home soon. Here's a sketch of my ankles. There we are. (laughs) She set off for the village of Galby. She was intending to call on her uncle there, George Measures. Uncle George, I must show you a picture of him. He has the most magnificent beard. Excellent. We like him already. He looks terrifying. (laughs) Big, beardy man with a cap on, like with piercing eyes. He looks like some sort of Russian dissident. Nice. Now, this is, as I said, really lovely countryside. You can picture full-blown quaint country lanes and fields and happy girls bicycling and laughing at nothing. (laughs) And Bella set out on her day, but she was hampered on her journey because of a loose wheel on her bicycle. So stopping to inspect it, she can't quite fix it. She spies a man who is riding very close by and he stops by. And the man, he's quite short, a little scruffy looking, but he himself is riding a very distinctive green bicycle. So he comes and he asks her if she needs help. She says, do you have a spanner? I think it's a loose wheel. We need to fix it. He doesn't have a spanner. He does what he can to fix the wheel so she can go on her merry way. Bella's very grateful. Okay, thank you so much. Get ahead off now. Bye. Oh, don't worry, he says. I'll ride with you. Oh, good. This won't be awkward at all. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I suppose we're headed in the right direction. in the same place. He was described as a man with a squeaky voice. Okay. It's all right. I'll go with you. <laughs> yeah, he is like <laughs> short, about five foot six, five foot seven, unshaven, a little bit scruffy, but he seemed harmless enough to her. Maybe a bit dull, but he was probably <laughs> being a gentleman, ensuring the young lady didn't encounter any trouble en route. So Quite why right. not accompany her? And, oh, okay, fine, we're going in the same direction. So they rode along, making small talk. The pair are seen by several people on their way who note the man's striking green bicycle. So Bella reaches her uncle's house and she thanks the man. Okay, I'm here. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going inside now. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> but I'm... Um, yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Man just stands there. Mm. I, okay, you go inside. I'll wait here. Okay, she's just backing down the, the <laughs> path. O- okay. She goes inside and Uncle Measures rightly says, who the fuck is that man outside? <laughs> He's like, there's a strange man outside in the company of his niece. And she replies, oh, him? 
I don't really know him at all. He's been riding alongside me for a few miles, and he isn't bothering me at all. He's just chatting about the weather. And Uncle Mo just goes, um, mm, meh. None of that. She says he's behaved very well on the ride. She describes him as a perfect stranger. Right. I don't know whether that's meant to be he is a perfect stranger to me. I've no idea who he is. Or he's a, he's a stranger, but he's mm. behaving perfectly well. Uncle Mej is, still isn't very happy about this man who's just hanging around outside his house waiting for Bella to come outside. She's never met him before. He weird. would say later on that he neither liked his looks nor his mannerisms. Maybe Bella goes, you are one to talk, Uncle Mej. <laughs> Uncle Beard. <laughs> Frankly terrible. No, she brushes them off. He's harmless. It's fine. As she leaves, though, she does turn to her uncle and says, I hope he doesn't get too boring. Okay. And she also says, I shall try and give him the slip. <laughs> Which Just I do tell like him that. to go away. But she's a nice girl. Well, Uncle Measure, Uncle George, go and chase him up in the room or something. <laughs> he is quite scary. All he exactly. has to do is stand outside. Stand out there and go, fuck off, man. <laughs> Well, he doesn't. She's probably holding him back. No, Uncle Measures, you've been in jail long enough. <laughs> you've killed too many. <laughs> no, off she goes outside, gets on her bike. The man's still standing there. And he says to her, the uncle overhears him say to Bella, Oh, you have been a long time. I thought you had gone the other way. I was literally in the house. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was there and not have to wait for me. Mm, yeah. Never met you before. You, we've all encountered those people who were just like, oh, you know, I'll just, I'll just walk with you. I'll just walk with you. Oh. That is annoying. You That's know nice. when you all say goodbye and you all turn and walk the same way? Yeah. <gasps> There's nothing worse. Especially when you, oh, I'm going to put my headphones on, listen to a book or listen to some music. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, no, we've got to have now more strained conversation. <laughs> best type of conversation is awkward conversation and that is what bella is thinking yeah. she gets on her bike like oh dear god and it's 1919 she can't go and get on a bus she's got to cycle <laughs> all the way home and this guy seems very determined to accompany her wherever she's going when she leaves the cottage her uncle's cottage it is about 8 50 p.m still light it's the summer yes. and the two ride off into the sunset possibly <laughs> the very romantic possibly not sort of way at around 9.20pm, a farmer named Joseph Cowell is walking out on a country lane and he encounters Bella. Or at least he found her body. Oh, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> he encounters Bella in 15 pieces in a tree. <laughs> There's a tiny bit of you that had hope, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, he finds her body. No, it's not in 15 pieces in a tree. Oh, Let's come back to that story at some point. Bella was lying on the side of the road next to her bicycle. Her face is covered with blood, mm. with marks on her cheeks. There are no footprints around her, no debris that he can see. The farmer immediately assumes that she has been the victim of a road traffic collision. That um. She's been on a bicycle, she has been knocked off, she has hit her head, and that's how she's died. Mm. He alerts the authorities... He alerts Constable Alfred Hall, who contacts a Dr. Williams to attend the scene. It's very dark at the time, by the time they arrive there. And the doctor is certain, as was the farmer, this is a road traffic accident. She's fallen off her bike. That's how she died. The doctor orders that her body should be moved to a nearby cottage, which is empty. I don't know, farmer's cottage or shack yeah. or whatever. Sort of labourer's cottage or something. Exactly, and they need to move the body off the road. Yep, They're going to move it, put her on the milk cart that the farmer has. Dignified, lovely. And she's moved off. No one knows who it is yet as well. They don't mm. know it's Bella Wright. PC Hall, he's not sure about any of this. And he thinks, okay, I need to go back to the crime scene. It's a little bit strange, this. So he goes back on the night and he goes back at 6am the next morning mm -hmm. to investigate. Loads is written about the fact that PC Hall just had the foresight to go, you know what, I'm going to go back to that crime scene and investigate. <laughs> He's a bloody policeman! He's a police person. He's meant to investigate. It's literally a job! So everyone's like, oh, he was so noble in to go and do his well, bloody I mean, job. You probably, there's probably not a lot of murdering going on in sort of Leicestershire villages and things. Mm. So his main job is like chasing the local cat or something. <laughs> the local uh, cat. The so, local cat has just been the scourge of his life. Yeah, so pretty much. So that's all he has to do all day. So mm. now he's going, oh, now something serious has happened. He's got to go, right, I actually need to do more than run around after a cat. Well, good for him. So good yeah, good for him. him, absolutely. Good for him because he did. He did go back to the site and he wants to investigate. An initial looks at candlelight this is how they conducted the initial search they hadn't found anything mm. then he doesn't come back and find like a big note that says i did it 
what he does find is very nearby there's a field gate into a field of long grass and there's a cornfield behind it, but beyond it on the field gate on the top bar there is a smear of blood Ooh, good spot and while they had not found any other traces of people around there he finds a set of bloody footprints Ooh. belonging to a bird <laughs> okay that's that's impressive going oh, it's okay. um, that gives new whole new meaning to a murder of crows it gets worse <laughs> oh god goes into the next field yeah he finds a dead crow <gasps> The crow is dead, it's bloodied, and its corpse lies there. He notes all of this down. Well, as he should. Yes, the crow did it. I'm not in touch with how those are linked. <laughs> it, unless she, she was bludgeoned to death by crow? Maybe, the crows just beset her. Yeah. This is just what was noted down. It was just what was noted down. Make Fine. of it what you will. And I will make many, many <laughs> random leaps. Yes. Dead crow in the next field. What's possibly more important than the dead crow... The smear on the field gate, it's like, how did that get there? Was it the, the the crow? Was the crow injured? The crow pecking at her or something like that and hop on the gate? Or did someone's handprint get on there? They find a path through the long grass. Mm. Like, so you know, when you trample through yes, long yes, grass yes. into the, the field next door. He, lots it's of crows. a bit like lots of crows. <laughs> a proper murder of crows. We did it, we did it, we All lived boots, up to one trampling name. trampling through. <laughs> Well, they're not sure whether that's one person. It, it seems fairly recent, but, you know, to make a footpath, it's got to be a little bit more indented. What's far more important is that when he examines the crime scene again, he finds embedded in dirt a .455 calibre bullet embedded in the ground about five metres away from where Bella mm. had lain. That's not going to be very common. Any sort of bullet. No. Okay. So PC Hall, now, finding this bullet casing... Rushes back to the cottage. Yes, has she been shot? Examines the body, washes all the congealed blood from her face, because mm. her face is covered in blood, and he finds a bullet <gasps> hole under her left Ooh. eye. She has been shot in the face. Well, that's dramatic. Shot in the face, under the eye, and it's exited at the back of the skull. That is the cause of death. Most of her the, brains. Well, not most of her brains. Her brains aren't all over the ground, because otherwise they probably would have noticed that. Oh, it's gone straight through. The doctor, he now goes, Doctor, t- not, not this what you is, said. You, not sh- a road traffic you awful, accident. awful doctor yet again. Doctor's greatest poison of them all. They now conduct a post-mortem. And he's like, yes, it is my conclusion that she is dead. And from a bullet, from a bullet hole. Someone yeah. driving a bullet very fast. <laughs> Someone just running at her with a bullet <laughs> yes. in a car. That's how it works. Yes. So the police immediately begin their investigation. Good, as they should. Bella is identified by relatives during this process. An inquest returns a verdict of murder by persons unknown. As Wise. Bella has clearly has been shot in the Yes, face. this is a clear murdery occasion. The authorities trace her last movements and they decide they'd really like to speak to the stranger who was riding the green, the green bicycle. bicycle. Yes, alongside her on the night of her death. The bicyclette vert. <laughs> You're so proud of that, aren't you? I was thinking, what's green, what's green, what's green? <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> Le vélo vert. <laughs> Le bicyclette. Uh, Le <laughs> Should you not just, like, stick to it and go, Le bicyclette green? Oh, that's very true. Yes, you should. Yeah, absolutely. Just get it right. Get the full French. You should absolutely do that. So, they're saying there, with their baguettes and their pipes. That was excellent. Da, Covered Le in berets. <laughs> The authorities do start trying to trace her last movements. And they're thinking, is it possible this man on the green bicycle lured Bella to a quiet country lane off her normal route, it seems, and did away with her? Did someone chase her down? Did someone chance upon her on this summer's night? If they could just speak to the man on the green bicycle, the police are sure they would get answers. So they ask around, but no one knows who this man is. They are able to provide a description. The people who had seen them cycling through, the uncle is able to describe him. And so the police and the authorities issue wanted posters, literally through the press, through the local and national media, describing him as a man of average height, aged 30 to 40 years old, and riding a pea green bicycle. Now, finding an average looking man (laughs) around then would be difficult if that's all they'd put out. He had dark hair and he was of average height and average age. (laughs) Average age. But the pea green bicycle that's is different. Gonna, that's going to be distinctive. Yeah, absolutely. Not many people are going to see that. And it's quite a bright green colour. And he everyone has remarked on it. Did he also have a pea green boat? And he went to sea. 
with a with an owl and a pussycat. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he made his escape. <laughs> the owl killed the crow. <laughs> the pussycat is just enjoying the bird. It's, it's, it's the cat that the constable is chasing around the village. Oh my god! <laughs> They're all in it together. <laughs> The constable's like, no, he betrayed me for the last time. <laughs> so in his pea green boat with his pea green bicycle, no one can find this man. They cannot trace him. Got to see. They make contact eventually with a bicycle repair man. They have gone to all of the bicycle shops in the vicinity, in the mm-hmm. county, and said, do you stock this bike? Mm-hmm. No, we don't. No, we have not sold it to anyone recently. But all they find is a bicycle repair man. Harry Cox, his name is on the 10th of July, who said he had repaired a bicycle matching that description Mm. the day before the murder. But he had no information on the man Uh. who had the bicycle. Back then, what are you going to do? You don't have a computer, you don't have any records of stuff. What did he do, like, fit machine guns or something to it? (laughs) (laughs) I think he would have remembered that. Yes. (laughs) I think he just repaired the wheel bit. The wheel bit. Yes, I don't know about bikes. Didn't put a gun mount or something on it. <laughs> maybe. It didn't work. Or maybe it worked very well. Yeah. <laughs> All seemed fairly hopeless over the weeks and months that followed. Um... Who killed Bella? <gasps> What happened to her? And where was this man on the green bicycle? It seems that all the leads are drying up. No one will ever know what happened in this case. Until... <laughs> Until <laughs> I love you're the perfect level of drunk right now because you're kind of like how uh, dare you? You're cruelly <laughs> nerd swept up in the mystery. Until the twenty third of February, nineteen twenty. What happened on the twenty third of February, nineteen twenty? We meet a man named Enoch Whitehouse. Oh, good. Good name, isn't it? Good name, Enoch. I imagine him old. Yes, great beard. Huge beard. Huge so beard. long. Actually, he is guiding a horse-drawn coal barge. Okay. Down the river Sour, mm-hmm. I, I think by his beard, by- he just <laughs> tied it around the horse. Right. So he, then- so he did. No, I, I feel probably what happened. He's riding the horse. The beard is tied to the barge. Oh, okay, that's very and good. It's like dragging the whole lot down. Oh yes, if you tied it to the horse, that would be an extravagance, wouldn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did not for a minute there picture how a horse-drawn barge worked. I thought the horse was on the barge. Oh, for fuck's sake. Come on. How does he do it? The, the horse is pedalling really fast. No, I know exactly what you meant. And all day I have known what that meant. And then in that second I was like, but the horse is on the barge having a lovely time. The horse is on the barge going, oh, it's, it's nice to have a load off. I'm on a boat. <laughs> this guy who's like that, I don't know, that weightlifting man from America who pulls <laughs> boats with his sheer strength. Yes. <laughs> Just uh, trying to beat a world world record while well, the horse is having a nice nap <laughs> on a big old pile of coal exactly lying around <laughs> rolling around he is That's but exactly what happened as enoch is about to cross the finish line and beat the world record uh he's ah, oh, the barge is hampered it's hampered the tow rope is caught on something in the river ah so he drags it up and out with the rope old enoch finds himself holding the handlebars <gasps> Of a bicycle. Is it green by any chance? It's a very distinctive green, very distinctive green. I bicycle. Thought it might be. This green bicycle, part of it has been Only found. Only the handlebars. Only the handlebars. Oh, it's in bits. The police drag the river and soon the rest of the elusive vehicle is recovered elusive vehicle it's a bicycle look I can only write bicycle so many times in this story Nick. <laughs> synonym 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 <laughs> And I, when I wrote that line, I knew you would have a go at me. I was writing it going, he's going to really yell at me for calling this a vehicle. He's yeah, gonna really going to yell at yes. me. <laughs> this two-wheeled mode of transportation <laughs> that they drugged out of the river. <laughs> this <is> preambulation. <laughs> That's walking. I hadn't finished. I hadn't thought of the rest. <laughs> that. Bicycle, the bicycle. bicycle. It's been dismantled into pieces, but the serial numbers have been filed off. Ooh criminal bicycle they've been filed off the frame and the seat and the under seat not the cushiony bit that's where the serial numbers are they have been filed off very 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 purposefully not just like whittled away by the river or fish (laughs) fish love a serial number they do love a serial number (laughs) great efforts have been made to conceal the model and the make of this bike and anything that would trace it back to the apart from the vibrant green colour yes (laughs) but then there must have been more than one well, green not. bicycle in the UK. <laughs> in the UK, yeah, in the UK, but not, not in the entirety of Leicestershire, apparently. But not enough has been done to this bicycle mm. because there's still a trace of a serial number <gasps> that can be found on part of the frame. And the police are able to trace it back to a man named Ronald Light. Oh. Now, who 
Is Ronald Light, you may be asking? Oh, well, I would, but I'm going to just tell me. The owner of the green bicycle. Ronald Light was born in 1885. We do know something <laughs> about Ronald and okay. his childhood. He's born into a wealthy family. His father owns a colliery. He is quite a successful engineer as well. Fancy. But while he has an auspicious start to life and, you know, a successful family, Ronald uh, quickly runs into trouble in his teens. He's expelled from school when he's 17 for lifting a little girl's clothes over her head. Mm, that's not so good. Ronald is pretty creepy. Yeah, that's pretty he's creepy. He's creepy. Later in life, he would be accused of improper conduct with an eight-year-old. Oh, dear. And trying to seduce a 15-year-old. Yeah, we're not liking Ronald so much. Yeah. In the reports, they don't really give the age at which these things happened. It's not good at any point. <laughs> Was he ever punished for this behaviour? Of course not. Daddy's rich. He would go on to study engineering in Birmingham. He got a job as a draftsman in the at the Midland Railway. He was fired from his job in 1914 for setting fire to a cupboard. That'll do it. And drawing indecent graffiti in a toilet. Ooh. He's got a penchant for fire. He's fired for another... Fired, literally. From another job. Let go from another job for setting fire to haystacks. Okay. I don't know if it was a haystack manufacturing company or the Bank of England. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there were many haystack factories. <laughs> Not after he had finished with them. <laughs> 24 hours a day churning out haystacks they were. <laughs> he did have a short spend in the army. Long story short on this one, there's, there's all sorts of detail that isn't very interesting, but he go into the army on a commission huh, surprise surprise he would be court-martialed for forging move orders in 1917 while on the western front so we did go to france for a bit he went to france very briefly he did and he was forging movements on a bicycle, <laughs> on a bicycle. there you are there we are there okay. we are so the bicycle on the bicycle <laughs> yeah on the bicycle he is eventually discharged for suffering from severe shell shock Maybe. And partial deafness. So, shell shock's no laughing matter. Indeed not. It does sound like he's a bit of a shit before the war began. This is very true, it does, mm. yeah. He ends up as a maths teacher. Again, not a great profession for someone like that. Mm -hmm. He's no. done fine in his life. He's said to be a broken man at the end of the war because his father had committed suicide. There's mm. all sorts of things that may have been brought up later in his life in court hearings about, oh, the poor man, he went through this, he went through that. Uh, he did seem like a little bit of a molesty wanker. Ronald, though, had bought his distinctive green bicycle back in 1910. It's a BSA folding bike. Oh, fancy. Mm, fancy. Now the police have their man. Ronald is arrested on the 4th of March in Cheltenham. He was arrested at the school he was teaching at at the time. Now at first he denies everything. I'm sure he does. I have never even been to Golby. I d I've never been there on the day of the murder. I've What's never a been bicycle? There ever. I don't know what a bicycle is. I don't. I've never seen Bella before my life. I don't own a green bicycle. I've no. never seen a bicycle. I don't, I don't know. What's a bicycle? None of it is true. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I have never... I don't have legs. I can't even ride a bicycle. The police point out that they know he owns the green bicycle because they have taken great pains to trace the serial numbers back to him. And then he said, yes, okay, fine, I did own the bicycle for a time, but I sold it. I totally sold it to someone else. He is then ID'd by witnesses who saw him on the day in the village, including being in an identity parade, and the bicycle repairman said, that is the man with the green oh, bicycle. Yep, yep that'll do it. <laughs> so it's him. His own maid, his mother's maid, he lived with his mother at the time, said that he arrived home on the night of the murder after 10pm, oh. having claimed his bicycle broke down on the way home, and then he immediately got rid of all of the clothes he was wearing on that day, either burning them or selling them. I mean, these are entirely innocent standard procedures for getting home who doesn't donate all their clothes Absolutely. after wearing them once In, yeah, well indeed i burn everything i wear after one wear a search of his house reveals his old army pistol holder and a collection of bullets mm. that are the exact same caliber mm. as the ones found at the crime scene so he got to stand trial now yeah yeah there's a lot of a lot of evidence going on there i feel june 1820 he stands trial in court Ronald claims having lied from the start saying he was never there, he had never seen Bella before in his life, he was like, okay, I was there, I was there, okay, all the evidence is mounted up against me. He will claim that Bella, he left her at the junction just beyond King's Norton, they reached a junction in the road, she went one way, he went the other way, never saw her again. He claims that he first heard about Bella's death by reading it in the newspaper a few days later, and he was so panicked 
panicked about would he be accused of the crime because people were asking about the man with the green bicycle. So what he did is he moved his bicycle up into the attic of his house. Okay. And he doesn't do anything. He doesn't go and speak to the police. He was afraid that it would affect his ailing mother. Yeah. Okay. And over time, he just keeps the bicycle up in the attic and then intermittently goes up and files off the serial numbers from the bike. <laughs> yeah, no guilty conscience there at all. No. Files them down. And yeah. then eventually feels like, now I've filed them down, I should get rid of them. So does this whole business is left behind me. And he would eventually end up on the Upperton Road Bridge hurling his dismantled bike into the river he is seen by someone doing this who yeah. was walking home from their night shift and just all right it's hello not entirely innocent behavior not entirely bright behavior yeah. either now the prosecution will claim that for whatever reason bella had fled from light on the night that she was killed that he had chased her down this smaller more quiet country lane and he had ended up shooting her in the face with his army pistol all of his actions he's destroying his clothes and the bicycle he gets rid of his gun the gun is i think found later in the river mm. but certainly the bullets some of the bullets are as well and him lying and changing his story to the police they're all pointing to the fact that he's guilty he has lied multiple times they also bring in two witnesses to the court the prosecution bring in a 12 year old girl and a 14 year old girl mm. who say according to one report that ronald light had pestered them a few hours before bella's death on the same sort of area on the same stretch of road they were riding bicycles he went up and he was talking to them and pestering them mm. Mm. in defense ronald light gives his own account I'm he sure is he happy does. to take the stand by the time he gets to court he doesn't deny anything that anyone has said to him apart from killing bella he says that he left her at the crossroads, but everything else that everyone has said, you know, throwing the bike into the river, mm. disposing of evidence, panicking, whatever else. Yeah, he's OK, fine. That's fine. But I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. I just panicked because I didn't want the police to suspect him. Well, maybe don't act suspicious then. That's the <laughs> thing to take away from this. But the defense go in with their logic. Why did he kill her? Why would well, he there, kill there her? Is that. What, what is the motive there? There is no evidence of any sexual assault. Yeah. No robbery. But it certainly seems like she would not be his target mm. demographic, as it were. Well, yeah. Um, based on what you've what you've explained, and then the two younger witnesses, sort of this uh, not an older woman, but a certainly more mature woman, is not perhaps what he is looking for. Indeed. Potentially, there's no hard evidence to link mm. him to the crime scene. The defence say if she had been shot in the face, and she clearly was being shot in the face, would her face not have exploded? <laughs> like, would there not be far more damage if it was that close range? Is it more likely that Bella had been hit by a ricochet bullet from somewhere else? He just ran, some just randomly firing. Well, mm. think of the evidence that was found around her: yeah. the dead crow. Well, someone was shooting at crows. Yeah. You go shooting at crows if you're a farmer or your your, 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 your yeah. kids. You know yeah, you're going to get rid true. of you, you know farmers go out and they shoot crows. Yeah, that is very that's a fair point. Was she accidentally killed by someone else? Was there a ricochet bullet? They did a lot of evidence about could she have been hit by a ricochet yeah. bullet? If she had been shot close range, would there not have been more damage? That's, they, a, that's what I meant. My reaction when you said that, I thought well, her brains would have been all over the place if it was. There you go. So yes. Mm. Yeah. There's all of this technical evidence. That's what the defence goes with. Technical, technical, technical evidence. And it is enough to plant a seed of doubt. Yeah. Ronald Light is found not guilty. So you've planted a seed of doubt in my head too, I have yeah. to say. It takes the jury just three hours to acquit him. So there are apparently cheers when he is acquitted. A lot of people are on his side because yeah. he's from a posh family. He's well-spoken. He's nice. Seems like a bit of a shit in general. For sure. But he's not a ruffian, is but. he? He is set free. Ronald Light would later move to the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. <laughs> okay. He remarried. He changed his name for a while. But he lived very much as a recluse mm -hmm. on the Isle of Sheppey, as you do. He died aged 89 in 1975. Always protesting his innocence, but really sure not engaging did. with uh, oh. with the public. And poor Bella was laid to rest mm. without anyone ever being convicted of her murder. So the green bicycle case, as it is known, remains unsolved. There are many mm. theories about what happened. Perhaps, though, we will never know who killed poor Bella Wright. Indeed not. Da, da, da.
Da! Oh, oh, you made me think. Mm. Yeah. Now, there's a couple of postscripts to the story okay. of the green bicycle murder mystery. Okay. Lots of people have been fascinated by this case. Mm. And if you do a preliminary bit of Googling, you'll find some stories about it where people go, oh, it's a story worthy of Sherlock Holmes, which uh, I started with. No, Basically, it's one author going, oh, I think Sherlock Holmes would have been standing there going, hmm, how would you solve this case? Well, you bloody didn't. And neither did these people either. They were like, Sherlock Holmes would have found this fascinating. Going, what? Someone died. Mm. <laughs> so tenuous at best. OK, true story. This is taken, it, literally, I've lifted this from Wikipedia, but I found it from other sources as well. This is supported by British Cycling, the organisation. <laughs> Leicester City Council organises an annual guided cycle ride, which reenacts the case of the Green Bicycle oh, Murder. <laughs> Participants visit significant locations pertinent to the case on the 5th of J July, 1919, and police investigations before proceeding to Leicester Castle, where segments of Light's trial were reenacted. I mean, is it any different than going on a Ripper tour? No, it's not. It's, it's not. no different. No different. So it seems weird, though. But it's an unsolved <laughs> murder. Yeah. So we've just told it in big detail, in great detail about what happened. But if you go, oh, a woman was mysteriously killed. Mm. In it was Jack the Ripper. It was Jack the Ripper. He was. He was in his retirement. He was on a, was on a bicycle. <laughs> He suddenly upgraded. That's how he got away. So there are theories about what happened to Bella. Mm. There's one that I'll come back to, which people go, that was it, that was it. I, I'm not sure I buy it. But do you have any theories or thoughts? Well, I'm not convinced it was him. I have to say, I'm not convinced it was him. So I, if I was on that jury, I would be inclined to say no. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, there's, I said there was no evidence Mm. A lot of circumstantial. Yes, he was in the area and he fully admits to being in the area. Mm. And you can almost see that, okay, he is obviously, well, he's most likely some sort of a, a paedophile. Um, yeah. He obviously enjoys chasing after young girls and whatever. And if he was there with these two other witnesses, 12 and 14 or so, then you can almost see the logic of get, getting rid of the bicycle, getting rid of that evidence, because he's scared of something else yeah what else has been covered what else up is, so what, what else is he, is he going to be accused of what people are going to dig up if he's put in that vicinity yeah. so you can almost understand that sort of getting rid of that thing even if he hadn't done it mm. um and what what if it was well what there was there seems to be no motive whatsoever no about any of this he certainly doesn't there's no sexual element to it if it was him he certainly doesn't seem to be the sort of person that he would be interested in so what on earth would be the motive well um, one theory about that still puts it as him as the perpetrator mm -hmm. which is what i said i'd come back to is that it was an accidental shooting that he had been talking to bella it was late at night whatever the circumstances were he had his revolver on him mm -hmm. he took it out he was showing her his revolver to show off and it went off and shot her in the face now there is a report i'll say that in inverted commas report however you want to say it a police officer uh, who was guarding him during his trial would claim after he had been acquitted that when ronald light came back into the the, the station he spoke to this officer and admitted to accidentally shooting her in the face and mm. this this officer conveniently wrote all this down and it's on record somewhere that he said that this is what Ronald Light said to him. Now, it's one person's word. After someone has been acquitted, you can't be tried of the same Don't crime, crime twice. twice. Yes, true. So is the officer just going, oh, I could make a bit of fame or let me let me just kind yeah. of get in on this. And also, if, if, even if you had done it and you got away with it, mm. why would you tell anyone? Why would yeah. you go, that no, I don't like it's a weird coincidence that the bullet caliber is exactly the same as that. His. That is that, that is peculiar, absolutely. That is a bit strange. Yeah. The other theory is that she was hit by a ricochet bullet by someone hunting crows. But the thing is, if you do that, surely if you're going to go after crows, you're going to go after shotguns. Farmers have shotguns and things. They do. Do you really have? I don't think you go hunting crows with a pistol. No. Or even a rifle. Or well, anything. some some people do. I mean, some people, some kids would do. Like literally, kids would yeah. go, you know, crow shooting, and they get a few pennies from, from the farmer. You've got some people who would just use it as practice or go out. Oh, I'm going to shoot crows as well. Well, late or maybe in the. I don't know. I mean, it, it would have been. It's something. about nine thirty in July, yeah, so it's just so just turning, getting dark. Just turning, your your vision's compromised. So the but... dead crow in the in the field next to it, this injured crow was. But yeah, I mean, but you would know if there was a if a crow gets hit <laughs> by a bloody bullet. Yeah, there's not going to be much crow left. <laughs> um. 
Maybe it just went straight through the crow and into her face. <laughs> yeah. So the crow took most of the most of the damage. But um yeah, I mean it, it does seem a huge coincidence that it's the same yeah. caliber as his his own gun. Why was he carrying a pistol around cycling around Leicestershire? Why would you just take a pistol with you? Um, well, unless it was for more nefarious purposes, that he was not intending to kill anyone, maybe he was intending to do something awful. Yes, just threatening someone to do something, yeah, yeah to get him, yeah, the, potentially the, that. The girls didn't um, say he pulled a gun on yeah. him or anything, but yeah, it's mm. it's weird, and there there is a chance that even if it was him, rather than, you know, standing there and going, oh, look at my gun, oh, bang, you know, he's been in the war, he knows how to fire a gun. True, yeah. Has he... Fine shot the gun to to impress her and it is one of those freak occurrences where it's ricocheted and hit her in the face it's killed her and he's like shit no one's going to believe me Mm. or did he just shoot her in the face but why would he shoot her in the face why would he shoot her in the face yeah yeah i can very much i can very much see it being an accidental thing either by him or some person's unknown in a field Mm. somewhere but (laughs) the crow did it the crow did it i think the crow did it bloody footprints (laughs) But just a murder suicide. Shoot her in the face. Seems uh, for a person you met that afternoon. Seems somewhat extreme. And that is why it is the green bicycle mm. mystery. It is certainly is a mystery. It is a mystery. It's an interesting one, isn't this it? One. It's a good story. Yeah. yeah. I started Many researching options. it, going, is this enough? And then when you get into it, you go, but yeah. why? Is an it's just enough to go No, no, mm. no, on every single theory you go, but why, why? Somewhere you just go, No, definitely it was them. <laughs> Well, it's a mystery, yeah. in inverted commas. But yeah, what what happened mm. to Bella Wright? Yeah, yeah, People call Bella. Why do they end up in terrible situations? Yeah, this is true, they do. Yes. <laughs> well, what do you think, people? Mm. Do you have theories about the green bicycle murder mystery? Do you have a green bicycle? Do you have a green bicycle? Were you there? Do you have a psychic instinct to what happened? Do you think that Bella was killed by Ronald Light? Not a very nice person, but was he just in the wrong place at the wrong yeah. time? Was this just a freak accident? Because they do happen. Did he kill her? Did something go wrong that he was planning? Was someone else stalking Bella? Or was it just another accident by another person? <laughs> and in that situation, Ronald Light went, oh, well, I'm fucked, and then tried to destroy all the evidence and made himself look far more guilty. Oh, yeah. Yet he still escaped prosecution there was that there was that hint of doubt oh, hint of there doubt doubt maybe we should call a cocktail that the hint of doubt the hint of doubt and the incident in a glass and the incident hint of doubt, glass and hint of doubt. <laughs> tell us your theories jump on the comments of any of the social media posts that you follow of this episode or just send us dms or just tell your friends scream it in the streets scream Do your it. theories in the streets scream. and your thoughts whatever they are but most importantly you need to mix yourself up a cocktail this a friday delightful bicyclette for all it's very nice it's gone down a treat it's gone we've, down a treat knock them back so oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, when was the last one of those I make, so yeah. I did really like that yeah. without being bowled over by any of the ingredients. It just worked. It's just a nice drink. And maybe that is the greatest poison of them all. The cocktail that works without you really knowing. <laughs> so, <laughs> recipe will be out this evening on the Instagram and the Facebook. So yeah, give it a go. Let us know what you think. And remember to tell all your friends about the Poisonous Cabinet. Send us more suggestions of stories that we can cover from all around the world wherever you are tell us where you're listening to the poisonous cabinet and send us stories from wherever you are and remember to come and join us on patreon for more episodes every week and bonus content and get yourself some merch from the store if you haven't already thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisonous cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you Bye.